किसान कल्याण मंत्रालय भारत सरकार Hello and welcome you watching DD Kashir I'm Parijat Kaur. Recently Kashmir University hosted the third international conference on crystal engineering. A number of scientists, science chroniclers, students participated in the event. But one name stood apart from others. Dr. Gautam R Desiraju. Uh, Gautam R Desiraju has a huge uh, history behind him in crystal engineering and actually it is his work that has put the conceptual term crystal engineering into uh, the scientific community uh, welcome to the show uh, desi rajji uh, tell me one thing about it what is exactly is crystal engineering well to understand what crystal engineering is uh, we should know what a crystal is crystals are uh, small shiny things which uh, are obtained by a process we call crystallization so salt crystals from the sea water sugar crystals from molasses diamonds are also crystals although the crystallization is done under very unusual circumstances and the conditions of very high temperature and pressure deep within the earth's crust so this is what a crystal is now engineering i think we all know engineering means to try to build something according to a plan so there has to be a plan and then you have to build it according to the plan so crystal engineering means instead of just getting things from nature like diamonds or salt or sugar uh, we want to build a particular crystal in a particular way and uh, why do we want to build it in this way so that we can achieve a certain property you see so a certain property is desirable we want the property so we work backwards from the property towards the kind of structure that will give rise to the property now i am using another word here which perhaps i should explain and that is structure i mean there is a colloquial english language understanding of structure but to a scientist a structure means anything with a certain form so there has to be some form to it only then we can call it a structure so we need a certain structure therefore to get that particular property that we want so then the question comes how do we get that particular structure from basic raw materials like when you build a house a house has a structure so let us say there is a ground floor there is a first floor and so on and what are the raw materials the raw materials are bricks in the case of uh, kashmir wood uh, cement iron steel etc so these are all the raw materials how do you put them all together so a crystal engineer does these things using the basic building blocks of a crystal which in our case is a molecule so you take molecules and then you put them together in a certain way to get a crystal of a particular structure which will then give a particular property that is desired so i would say the long and short of crystal engineering for at least non scientific people uh, would go something like this so you know when when this uh, whole discussion we talking this is all clear how to do it what crystal is uh, you often tell the story that there was a, a lot of difficulty in getting scientific community to accept this conceptual term even after when it was used in 1955 by uh, pepinski and then by schmitz and then after it went to you know like oblivion and then you actually had to fight for it what is the story about well you are asking a question not in science but in sociology and i'm not scared of sociology 
and in fact there is something uh, called the sociology of science and i think the i wouldn't call it a struggle but i would say the journey towards getting crystal engineering established as a regular part of the chemical lexicon which is where it is today i think it is a natural process which is definitely a part and parcel of science let me explain dr kaul what what i mean by this see in science we communicate our results and uh, in the form of papers in the form of scientific lectures and in the form of formal and more informal discussions and when we communicate our ideas the natural thing for a scientist and in science is to get criticism it is a natural self correction mechanism which is inherent to science so we scientists are not used to going out there and simply making what i call you know ex cathedra statements you know saying this is what it is or this is what you know it's going to be or i think this or i feel this you know scientists generally let me say in a rigorous sense <laughs> we don't think and we don't feel <laughs> those because that comes into the gray area we look at the data and then try to deduce certain things logically from the data and on that basis a scientist will say based on what is perceived as correct or not correct today this is what looks like a reasonable conclusion that is how most scientists behave so pepinski was there you are quite right in mentioning pepinski who you first used the word crystal engineering in 1955 but then as things went along you see there was more and more people using it and then there were people who started questioning for example is it engineering what exactly are you people doing should should we honor it with a special name because once something gets a special name nano chemistry medicinal chemistry pharmaceutical chemistry then the community has in a sense given it its blessing and that is a strong vindication about the sturdiness and reliability of a scientific concept so this takes time and in the case of crystal engineering i would say that starting 1955 through the 60s 70s i wrote my very famous book at the in 1989 at that stage i would say that was a watershed moment because the title of the book itself is crystal engineering and so it's the first time i was really uh, let me say confident enough to use this crystal engineering word as a title of a book and uh, the subsequent treatment that this book received and the reception it received now of course go abundantly to show that uh, this word is now thoroughly accepted and if you take uh, key words that we have to put let us say when we submit a scientific paper we have to give four or five key words um, in most chemistry journals of the world today crystal engineering would be an accepted keyword you could have things like hydrogen bonding nano science medicinal chemistry so like that crystal engineering has now become an accepted keyword so i would say in that sense uh, we are now part of the system as it were so you you say that uh, this is the contribution of india to the scientific community <laughs> well your question is slightly embarrassing as i said the 1989 book was a watershed moment and yes i wrote that book it was a single author book so i was the only author i think perhaps it is still this single author book uh, on the subject yeah i think so i think so i i wrote a textbook with two other colleagues in 2011 but it is still the only single uh, it, it has stood the test of time people still use it and people still use my definition of crystal engineering which i put in one of the early pages of the book so yes um, i had a quite a bit to do with this word crystal engineering but there were others 
they were very uh, significant in the kind of contributions they made. Uh, there were others not in India, but in, in some other countries of the world who liked this crystal engineering name because they felt it adequately expressed what they were trying to convey through their scientific ideas. So, you see a name, you see I can give any name I want, but it has to be useful and it people have to identify with that name. Unless the identity, unless a scientist identifies with that particular name, he or she is not going to use it. It's a simple test. It's the test of the marketplace. You know, we can't uh, force anybody to accept any name or something like that. People try, but then gradually those names fade out. Uh, this one has stayed. Uh, but yes, I think perhaps because I was from India, perhaps in the late 80s, early 90s, it was so such a novelty for people in the chemistry community at least to see a new idea coming out of India. They were not used to, they were certainly, you know, Indian chemists before my time who were well known abroad. But to actually go as far as to give a name backed up by my own work of course. I mean I just did not write that 1989 book just out of the top of my head. I had already done 10 years of research before I wrote that book. I started in the University of Hyderabad in 1979. So, it was 10 years later that I wrote the book. Uh, yes, it was the novelty that the, here was somebody from India. India in the late 80s was let us be frank at least in the scientific community uh, was still very much considered a basket case. You know they could afford to patronize us and say oh yeah so and so is pretty good we have seen his work and so on and so on. I think many of them were just trying to be polite. But I do not think we counted seriously and I cannot speak for other subjects but I can certainly speak for chemistry which is my own subject. We saw stalwarts in chemistry in natural products chemistry and so on in the 50s and 60s and so on. But for many years uh, a new idea, a fresh new idea in, in, in chemistry coming out from India was not known. So, I think there was a novelty factor and then people of course started taking more and more interest in my publications because people even a little bit outside my area started saying that you know hey there may be something in these things that is useful to us too. We will take this forward, we will just, we'll, we'll just take a short break and come back and we will take this uh, story forward. Stay with us. अब देश बड़े संकल्प लेकर के ही चलेगा और वो बड़ा संकल्प है विकसित भारत प्रधानमंत्री जी का ये विजन अमृत काल में है हर देशवासी का संकल्प जिसको गति दे रहा है आपके द्वारा दिए गए एडवांस टैक्स का एक एक रुपया तो आइए विकास के इस लक्ष्य की ओर कदम बढ़ाएं और समय पर अपना एडवांस टैक्स जमा कर प्रगति की गति बढ़ाए याद रखिए वित्तीय वर्ष 2022-23 के लिए एडवांस टैक्स की दूसरी किस्त का 15 सितंबर 2022 तक अवश्य भुगतान करें कॉर्पोरेट्स अन्य संस्थाएं सैलरीड एम्प्लॉज या फिर वे व्यक्ति जिनकी टी डी कटने के बाद भी कर देता दस हजार रूपए या उससे अधिक है उनके लिए एडवांस टैक्स देना आवश्यक है प्रत्येक आयकरदाता एक राष्ट्र निर्माता
डैडी की गुड़िया पल में जो भर दे खुशियों से दुनिया खट्टी मीठी बातें मस्ती मुलाकातें दिल में बसी सब के इस घर की बेटिया हर घर के हर दिल में बसा अमूल ताजा हमेशा फ्रेश इस घर की बेटिया वेलकम बैक वी आर विद प्रोफेसर देसी राजू Uh, Professor Desi Raju has uh, done a lot of work in crystal engineering, and he has sixty-four thousand citations to his name. So that's uh, quite a lot. So, uh, Professor, uh, we were talking about uh, you know uh, crystal engineering, mein how how it works. How is it different from uh, bonding, as in halogen and hydrogen bonding? Was it uh, the resistance to this was because of it was already popular and Hi- hydrogen bonding and halogen bonding? They are all, I would say, parts of crystal engineering. let's go back to what i said about building a house so if the bricks are the molecules the cement uh, are the hydrogen bonding and halogen bonding so the hydrogen bonds are the things that keep molecules together so you would say very much that would you consider the brick the part of the house or the cement a part of the house so both are parts of the house so we need molecules and we need the interactions and this is how we build up crystals so you are professor and uh, you are in academics also so what is the situation of academics of uh, in india on crystal engineering because unless that uh, expands we will not have more scientists like you unless we have more scientists like you we will not be expanding towards industrial uh, part of it so yes. how is it placed see i am optimistic and also looking forward uh, crystal engineering is one of the few subjects where we indians have secured uh, a commanding position in the world scene it started with me of course and uh, gradually by the middle 90s other indian academics started switching over from their field to crystal engineering now this is something quite unusual because it happens quite frequently abroad but rarely so in india where people don't like to come out of their comfort zones but people in india chemistry people did start switching from their fields and come into crystal engineering starting the middle 90s and then of course the way in which usually academics propagates uh, our students and postdocs when they started taking up independent faculty positions uh, would continue to uh, spread this scientific message through their works so gradually as you can see it is like a pyramid thing which then starts building out and building out and building out so today we i would say uh, yesterday i was there in pahalgam uh, at this uh, crystal engineering conference i would say there are 30 strong groups in india who very definitely are working in what i would call orthodox crystal engineering that is the central portion of this subject and there may be another 20 30 research groups who are working in areas that are reasonably allied and at least have some coherence with the crystal engineering subject so this is by the way uh, 50 or 60 groups like this it's really quite a critical mass for any country to have in any you know scientific field so yes we have main, got an early advantage but as you know uh, it is one thing to get into a good position it's quite another thing to maintain that position before other people start other countries start coming up you see so nobody is going to keep silent and uh, no one country has a monopoly on any one scientific area obviously so it's quite a democratic thing anybody can work anywhere and you know get into the subject which is what they are doing and this is the very fact that we have had two very strong uh, crystal engineering uh, scientific journals from the two leading chemical societies of the world the american chemical society in the usa and the royal society of chemistry in the uk uh, these two journals of theirs uh, have been going strong for the last almost 25 years so which means that any subject that has two strong journals from the two leading chemical societies of the world i mean it's there it's quite a big it's quite a big area now and uh, so you're going to have lot of practitioners uh, about 10 years ago i think i had tried to ask one of my post docs to actually enumerate the number of groups worldwide who were into crystal engineering but you know it was just for fun and we actually gave it up after some time because there was so many people 
uh, and it's very difficult to you know actually count all these things. But let's say yes, the India has got a position, but we have to maintain this position. We should not let it go. Now that this is one of the few areas where we have actually been able to secure a niche. The world of international science is very competitive, and uh, we can't stay there and just say, oh, we were great in former times. You know, so, Professor, uh, when we talk about uh, you know uh, maintaining the lead. Uh, it is very important to have some applications uh, of the uh, research that we do because that we we tend to assess everything on basis of how it is useful it is to humankind, not necessarily uh, finance only, but uh, how it can improve life. So, uh, where does crystal engineering stand in terms of being used as an application in industry? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, you have stated, uh, Mr. Cowell, an essential thing about the viability of a scientific area, that too, especially in chemistry. there has to be a commercial and industrial application for an idea to be really you know take roots and become very strong and get more adherents because you see there is a simple reason if industry is very interested in a particular area they would like to employ your graduates from the academic institutions and too often in india we have been plagued by this syndrome that phd students from our iits and icers and TIFRs and IISCs and so on. The only thing they want to do in life is to take up a faculty position in one of these places, and this is a very sort of, may I say, incestuous way of uh, uh, trying to propagate the race. And uh, the answer actually is to be seen in other countries where the bulk of the PhD students go into industry. So, this is one aspect. But in terms of people and how it helps them. let me give you a, a, a familiar example which i think non scientists will also appreciate we have this drug called paracetamol there is nobody around who is watching this program today who's probably not taken a tablet of paracetamol in his or her life now how many know that you know paracetamol is sold as tablets so there is something called making the tablet you have to take there's a powder and then they put it in a kind of a dye under pressure and then you make this you get the tablet now paracetamol as it turns out exists in two solid forms hmm mark my words carefully two solid forms which are called polymorphs that is many forms from the greek word poly meaning many and morph meaning form so there are two forms of paracetamol these two forms are the same chemically speaking interestingly they are the same chemical they are the same compound but in terms of the solid state structure they are different for example if you go back to the building the house analogy with the equal amount of bricks and cement i can put up a small two story house or i can put a larger single story house that's clear so polymorphs are like that the building blocks are the same but the final structure looks different now as it turns out these two forms of paracetamol one of them can be tableted very easily and forms good tablets the other form when you put it in the high pressure dye it becomes pasty becomes like a paste it cannot form tablets out of it so easily So you see, industry is very keen when it is processing this paracetamol and making it that we only get the good form of paracetamol. You don't want the bad form. Chemically speaking, they are both the same. So if you subject them to a chemical analysis, it will come out exactly the same. But that doesn't help you. You want the form that is tabletable. Now, so far, it looks innocent. Now I'll add a. Eh? complication of geopolitics and you can see now this whole crystal engineering subject industry is now going somewhere else suppose a country i'll be very specific china which is making most of the paracetamol in the world today we are not making it incidentally we import the raw material from china and we make the tablets here that's another story altogether which i don't think we want to get into in this in this particular program now the problem here is that 
when china sells this paracetamol it sells the good form at a high price to europe and america it will sell the bad form to india at a very cheap price because that has the bad form has no value no market in anywhere else in the world so suppose you have a indian manufacturer who is trying to look for the cheapest material that he can get he doesn't know and if he goes and tries to get an essay for it they'll tell him chemically these are all the same and according to the rules of the land right now if it is chemically the same then officially they are treated as the same so he will buy the cheap version maybe he doesn't even know that it is a bad version but you see this is this is where you need i would say a high level scientific input to actually tell the people that there are two forms and there is a good form and a bad form and basically what china is doing it is dumping the bad form on you i think there has to be some realization and there has to be a realization from the government that they cannot employ strictly chemical criteria to judge polymorphs they have to employ crystallographic criteria and this i am using another word now crystallographical comes coming from the subject crystallography which is the study of crystals so they have to employ only crystallography criteria because only those criteria will distinguish the good form from the bad form of paracetamol so you require close coordination between government industry scientists this kind of a intellectual supply chain is not there today in india oh, you were talking about uh, you know some some form of uh, judging how to judge to import things what crystallography to be used uh, so that so that we industry in india knows that what they are buying from outside uh, how would you how would you propose to do it like in in the sense that the research that you have done so far the research being done that is being done here to be utilized by industry in india there are two parts to your question uh, mr kaul uh, industry should realize uh, the importance of higher level science the big industries do i mean i am familiar with the pharmaceutical industry in india so i know the bigger companies certainly realize that this is a highly technical thing and they also employ very good scientists uh, many of them i would say in crystal engineering some of my students and postdocs and uh, students and postdocs of some of my close associates so there is no lack of qualified people in crystal engineering in the pharmaceutical industry i think uh, the problem that they face uh, is of a different type it is not scientific but more in terms of the financial aspects and the fact that they could probably expect a little more from the government i mean part of the reason if if i could just finish part of the reason why we are importing chemicals from china is because the chinese imports are cheaper than what we make here and here i think government should can and should give them some direct benefits either in terms of a subsidy as china does or in terms of uh, tax cuts uh, it cannot be just uh, incentive based uh, you know rewards and performance based uh, uh, rewards and things like that they have to take industry also on trust and i start giving them out the difference in price between the chinese import and the indian produced thing is only about 10 to 15% i say only 10 to 15% but if uh, industry faces a 10 to 15% loss they are out of business so that's still too much for them so somewhere government has to come in and become more proactive because if they don't do that china really holds a, a gun to our head in terms of the pharmaceuticals thank you dr das professor Uh, that was professor gautam ar desi raju speaking to us about crystal engineering in india and his pioneering work in it thank you and keep watching dd kashir अभी तो बजट टाइट है दुबे